Hello and welcome to Sum Zero. Um, today uh, we have uh, one of our most prolific contributors on Sum Zero talking to us, David Trainer, um, and uh, we are going to be talking about uh, two of the more widely discussed stocks out there: Netflix and Disney. Um, how they are similar and how they're different. <laughs> now, David, you're uh, you're not only prolific on Sum Zero, but you're also uh, prolifically short, uh, oftentimes, on Sum Zero, and I think. Uh, Probably as as just an intro, uh, it would be helpful to just hear a little bit more about your um, investing philosophy. Um, I know you, you take a very dispassionate approach, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you've constructed your investing framework at New Constructs. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we've been on Sum Zero for a long time, and, and I love having, uh, having an objective, objective perspective on our stock picks and somebody to track the performance there. And as you pointed out. Yeah, a lot of the stocks we've been warning investors about for a long time have uh, finally really cratered. Um, Netflix, one of them, Peloton, another, Beyond Meat, uh, Robin Hood, the list goes on and on. Uh, and look, our detractors will say we were short for a long time, and it's true. Uh, the logic hasn't changed. Uh, for a long time, these stocks have been terribly overvalued. And when you say dispassionate, you know, I, I like to say mathematical, objective. I'm not in the business of trying to influence people. You know, I'm, I'm not a Elon Musk. I'm not an influencer. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not trying to bedazzle you with wild claims. I just want to impress upon you the logic of the perspective. And by, by that, I mean understanding what the cash flow performance of the company has to be to justify the price. And that for Netflix, you know, means that they have to have something like four or 500 million users. Um, and cut content costs by like 50% at the same time, right? So, um, and, you know, for a company like Tesla, it means they're going to have to, they're going to have to sell more cars than the entire electric vehicle market is expected to be in 2030. So we're not in there trying to, you know, have a lot of crazy opinion and, you know, convince people by force of argument that we're right. We're just giving them numbers and putting down some obvious risk reward uh, analysis that is part of why we perform so well on your platform. Our shorts have done really well and our longs have done a lot. Yeah, it's worth noting that, um, David, your, your ranking amongst uh, the analyst community has, has shot up uh, to the top. <laughs> um, as of uh, recently, you know, some of this obviously has to do with macro reasons and, you know, rate hike fears and, and, and just kind of what's going on at the central bank. Um, but I do like kind of your your framework, um, kind of the reliance on modeling. And I do think that, um, you know, whether you're a, a bull or a bear on any given stock, you, you should know, you know, what the price of that stock implies um, on, on a fundamental level in terms of cash flows, in terms of growth, um, and, and all of the sort of fundamental metrics that matter. So with that, um, I also think this is a timely discussion because of Bill Ackman's recent, you know, position or stake in Netflix. Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but can you just, uh, do you know what the size of his investment was? It, 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 was it a few hundred million or? Uh, I think he, billion? yeah, it was a few hundred million, you know, and I'd like to, to note a, a couple of things. First of all, I agree. There's no reason to ignore fundamentals unless you just don't want to know, them, right? Like it's helpful and you might have 10 great momentum ideas, but if you can marry those to the ones that also have good fundamentals, it's just a win-win, right? I feel like what we're doing is honestly a service to the marketplace. Uh, and, and when it comes to Bill Ackman, we've been on the opposite side of the argument uh, for Bill, uh, Bill Ackman a few times, uh, notably with Valiant. He's a big bull in Valiant. We warned people to stay away from that. They were in the business of capitalizing expenses and, and, and really pushing their non-GAAP EBITDA. And as I used to like to joke, you can't pay bills with a non-GAAP EBITDA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He went after Herbalife, you know, we said, no, that's a, that's a great business. Uh, and, you know, we were right both times. Uh, Bill Ackman makes a lot of money, don't get me wrong. But, you know, anytime you see someone like that talking their book, that obviously you need to, you need to, you need to look a little closer. Um, he may have a big position here. He's looking to, to save or to get, get rid of. Um, and then when it comes to our research, look, the numbers speak for themselves. So let's go, let's go through them. I mean, uh, on your report on Sum Zero itself, you mentioned that Netflix is overvalued by at least $114 billion. 
and you know this was as of the price uh, back on January 27th. Um, I forget what that was, but um, maybe walk us through kind of uh, you know where you're getting to your and and also add. I think your target price on Netflix is around $130 a share. You know, it's trading today as of this recording at, at $430 a share. So it's a, it'd be a 300 point drop, um, quite substantial from, from current levels. Um, you know, can you just walk us through the key kind of drivers of your, your evaluation and how you're coming to that conclusion? When we wrote the report, the stock was at 380 bucks a share. And what we showed using our reverse discounted cash flow model, which is an, uh, based on the book Expectations Investing, where you're looking to, you know, again, quantify the, the future expectations baked in the stock price, we, f- we find that the company's got to maintain its 2020, 2020 NOPAT margin of 16% while growing revenue at 14% compounded annually through 2027. In that scenario, the stock would be worth 380 bucks. Uh, it would generate 63.1 billion by the year 2027, which is 4.8 times the trailing 12 months revenue of Fox Corp, 2.4 times the trailing 12 months revenue of Viacom, and nearly the same revenue as Disney in the trailing 12 months. So effectively, Netflix is, is priced you know, to become one of the largest media businesses in the world of, of all time. If you want to look at this at a subscriber level and see what kind of subscriber numbers are implied by this, 380 bucks a share and that level of revenue based on that margin imply the company's going to have, or Netflix will have 472 million subscribers at an average monthly price of $11.15. That's the sort of audience-wide or company-wide average subscriber uh, revenue, not the $15.49 they charge in the U.S. because they make a lot more money on their U.S. users than they do their international users, which is where almost all the growth is coming from. So we think the the average subscriber revenue is a much better number. So that's what's baked into 380 bucks a share. We just think that that's, that's way too much. Um. You know, to your point on the 14% revenue growth, I guess, how does that fare with kind of their historical growth? What have they been putting up growth wise, you know, let's say over the last five years? I mean, I think if you're, if you're going back a ways, revenue was, was a lot higher than that. Um, higher growth, higher growth was, growth was higher than that. But I think in more recent years, you know, that's, about the norm, it has been decelerating. Uh, look, it's sort of part of it's the law of large numbers. Part of it's really a big point here, and all of this about Netflix is the, is the number of, of users. I mean, sorry, the number of competitors. I mean, there are like how many different streaming services out there? They're all cheaper than Netflix now, uh, and you know where they had a first mover advantage and had a lot of growth, they don't anymore. Uh, a lot of growth opportunity, they don't anymore. So. Um, yeah, the revenue uh, is, it's a big number for multiple years in a row or the company that already has as much revenue for sure. Uh, on the competition front, who do you see as their biggest threat? I mean, because a lot of people, a lot of the bulls would say that, you know, they do have the best content and spend the most on content and therefore should be, you know, uh, should have a larger market cap than some of the other incumbents in the space, take it to Disney, what have you. But I'm just curious what your take is on, on that, which is kind of a, a common argument I hear from the bulls on, on the story. Yeah. I mean, the bull, I feel like the bull argument there really holds no water because when you look at Netflix versus competitors, especially like the biggest one, Disney, Disney made 20 billion, generated $20 billion in free cash flow over the last five years, excluding the Fox acquisition. Netflix burned 10 billion. The only year they didn't burn like a significant amount, a couple of billion in cash flow was 2019 when they had to cut back on content spending. And we've now seen the effects of the cutback on content spending in a major decline in subscriber growth, right? So Netflix's business model is really in this catch 22. They can have profits or they can have subscriber growth. They can't have both. And that's just a fact, uh, you know, and the, the superiority of Disney and a lot of the other competing businesses, these other studios, 
right, is that these other businesses have ways to monetize content that Netflix does not. Streaming content is, there's no moat around that business. What's the competitive advantage of streaming content? We're streaming content. Anyone can do it. <laughs> right? I mean, YouTube. Speaking of, speaking of competitors, yeah. I mean, where do you see YouTube in, in the sort of the competitive landscape vis-a-vis -vis Netflix? I think YouTube is a major competitor. I mean, I think that uh, I saw a chart today that showed the, uh, um, I think the, the advertising revenue on YouTube is significantly greater than all the subscriber revenue from um, Netflix. Uh, and that's all user generated. Like, so YouTube's got no content costs, right? Um, I, the point is, I'm not going to say that any one of these competitors needs to be the one that puts Netflix to rest. The point is, it's a death by a thousand cuts, death by a thousand competitors, right? I don't care how good a fighter you are, you know, you might be able to beat anybody one on one, but Netflix isn't having a one on one battle. It's one versus 10, and they're all coming at them from different angles. Some of them straight head on, like HBO Max, high quality content, right? Uh, some of them with live content, like Hulu and YouTube TV, and then there's just playing YouTube, right? I mean, it's another big competitive advantage of Netflix. They don't have any answer for live content. That's the one thing you can actually really charge for, right? Um, over the long term, that's the one thing that's proprietary. So, um, what would you say is the biggest risk to the bear thesis? I mean, what what do you think? What do you think they could do um, that would change your mind on you know what their future growth prospects could be that might justify the price being kind of what it is? Like, obviously, growing, you know, getting you know, that extra hundred million subscribers and all that would, would be accretive, but, but how do they actually get to that? You, you think it's just massive cash flow burn or do you think there's another path for them? I mean, I think that that's the million dollar question, right? And that's the question we want our readers always to ask. That's the question we ask ourselves when we form an investment opinion, right? We look at what the market price implies in terms of future cash flows, the future economics of the business. And then we say, can we make a straight faced argument that the company is going to achieve that? And if so, how and what is it? And you know, with Netflix, I kind of have a big blank. Like, I mean, you're right. They got another hundred million subscribers to drop out of the sky. That would be great. Um, how are they going to do that? Isn't that getting harder every day with all these other firms out there competing and streaming? What's the international uh, sort of story? I mean, maybe to to fine tune that a little bit. What do they charge internationally versus what they charge in the U.S.? They charge lower prices. I don't know um, exactly what they charge internationally. I didn't look that up. I'm sure uh, one of the guys on the team, Kyle or, or Matt or Brian, saw that. I just know that the combined average monthly user per subscriber is $11.15. And they charge the, the high end price in the United States is $15.49. So I think they're charging quite a bit less internationally. And is the fact that they raised prices to 15 directly responsible for the lower subscriber growth in the U.S.? Or is it too early to tell kind of how prices imp impact their subscriber growth? I think it's a little too early to tell on that. I think this, the, the decline in subscriber growth uh, is directly related to the big cut in content spending that we saw in 2019. Uh, that's the only year uh, they were positive. Let me take that back. In 2020, it was the only year that Netflix was positive, free cash flow. They cut way back in spending um, and they didn't generate as much content. They didn't have as many hits and uh, subscribers growth, you know, plummeted. Uh, and we think this, you know, this coming year, they already bragged about how they're going to spend like 17 billion. So I think we're going to see, you know, something like negative five, probably five or 10 billion in, in subscriber. I'm sorry, in free cash flow uh, for, for Netflix this coming year. Uh, but and, and we'll see what happens with subscribers. That's kind of the million dollar question, right? It, it is are they going to see a good rebound on that? Because they kind of need to, right? Uh, we they need to see subscriber growth bounce back if they're going to be sending spending that much. Because if they spend that much and they still don't grow subscribers, then you really know the business model is broken. There's no argument. What is the um, from a cash flow standpoint? Are they expected to like? How much are they expected to burn in 2022? Or are they, are they sort of break even? Where are they at and for this coming year from a cash flow standpoint? Well, for trailing 12 months, they've burned about $3 billion. Um, I, don't, I don't think they, they don't produce a reliable number for free cash flow 
um, themselves. Uh, in fact, they really kind of obscure the profitability of the business. They overstate it because they capitalize most of their content creation costs. So they move all that off the income statement, right? <laughs> and they amortize it over, I don't know, at least five to seven years or something like that. Um, so that all this upfront cost to create content doesn't really affect earnings. It makes your margins, makes your returns on capital look much better in the near term, but it does not change your free cash flow. Moving it from the income statement to the balance sheet doesn't mean you didn't spend it. You still mm-hmm. spent it. And we're looking at is free cash flow. And so uh, we look at what the real expenditures are and, and from, from that derive like a real measure of, of cash flow. And um, that's part of why, you know, Divya, like for me, like the whole subscriber growth argument has always been a red herring because why is it good to grow subscribers if you're not making money per subscriber, right? And they've never made, they've never sustained a profit on their subscribers, uh, no matter how much they've grown or how many they have. It's a money losing business. And if they haven't made, been making money right up to this point, I don't think the chances that they're making, gonna, gonna make money are getting better considering the huge amount of competition that's flooded the space. And then on top of that, the ability for the competition to monetize content theme parks, merchandising, et cetera, that Netflix does not have. So, so on, on the subject of competition, um, you like Disney. So maybe walk us through that. Just how does that, how does Disney fare in your own valuation model? And how does it compare on some of the same metrics you've looked at for Netflix? Yeah, Disney's a very interesting uh, model for us because if you look at just sort of the existing economics, you look at our rating on Disney, it doesn't match with our sort of our focus list call on Disney and our, our report with yours because we're looking at the future. And what we see with Disney is very different. We see a huge decline in return on invested capital because of the Fox acquisition. But we think Disney will return to its high return on invested capital ways just as it has after every acquisition. And the big difference for Disney, again, is it's a, it's a cash flow generating machine. 20 billion over the last five years while Netflix is losing over 10 billion. Right. That's a big flip. Uh, and this is before Disney Plus. Right. And I mean, think about like Disney Plus is not hard for, for Disney. Like they already have all this content. They got a huge catalog of content that they can they can tap into. They don't have to spend as much on Netflix to create new content. Um, and then the streaming is just another channel. For invest for, for, for clients to come in and move through the profit generating profit generating machine that is already Disney. Right, see how much of an advantage that is? Like Disney's making a lot of money. They open another door to bring customers in to make money on them. Uh, they just low, they're just making what they're making their content more accessible by opening another channel. And again, between theme parks and merchandising uh, alone, you're just seeing huge amounts of cash flow that the business is able to generate uh, in the content business. And they've done that really well for a long time. Uh, is, is free cash flow yield kind of your primary metric or, or what, what would be your, I'm just curious of, of like what metric do you care about with respect to Disney specifically that, you know, you, you maybe focus the most on? Uh, well, you know, look, I don't believe in any one metric. You know, I don't think investing is that simple. Uh, when you look at the rating systems that, that drive our analysis, there's five metrics. There are two buckets, two are quality of earnings where we look at economic earnings as opposed to accounting earnings. And we look at those trends. Uh, then we look at return on invested capital. Uh, and look, there's papers written out there that show that we have the best data and best models for return on invested capital in the world, uh, written by Ernst & Young, Harvard Business School, and MIT Sloan. Um, those are our two quality of earnings metrics. And then we have three valuation metrics. Free cash flow yield is one of them. Price to economic book value is another one. And that's economic book value is a cash-based book value for business. And then our third valuation metric is the market implied competitive advantage period or growth appreciation period. That's the number of years of implied profit growth baked into the stock price. And that's a big feature of a reverse DCF model. Uh, most importantly, meaning that you, you have a no growth terminal value in your reverse DCF because you don't force every company into a five or 10 year time frame. You make that, temp, that time frame flexible and you go out as many years as you need for the model to generate a price equal to the current stock price. Uh, and the key thing being that in every year of that model, you've got a no growth terminal value. That's just a much more conservative way of running a DCF in general, because these 
I can go down a rabbit hole in terminal values, but it's, it's just a better way to do it. So five, five metrics go into our overall rating system, economic versus accounting earnings, return on invested capital, free cash flow yield, price to economic book value, and market implied competitive advantage period. Uh, and, those and this, things are equally weighted. How does Disney fare on those? Disney gets a Disney right now gets a very unattractive rating uh, on that level alone, and it's a great example of how we use our ratings as a starting point. Uh, you know, a lot, most of our clients are institutional investors, and uh, I usually know the meeting's not going to go so well when I'm talking to someone who's like, "Just tell me what the stock price should do." You know, just give me the answers. Um, we're not for people who just want answers. We're people. We're for people who want a better starting point. And so, if you look at Disney through just our rating system, which is going to be overly weighted toward the last the last year or two of, of the economics of the business, the business looks bad because, you know, they paid a lot for that, that Fox acquisition. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, you have to kind of go in and model the business a little bit more proactively in the way we have to look at what the implied value of Disney is if you assume returns on invested capital bounce back from where they were before the Fox acquisition. And when you do that, we're seeing around, we're seeing a stock price of around 180 bucks makes a lot more sense. Got it. Um, is, do you think of Disney Plus as, as kind of potentially achieving the same scale as Netflix? Is that, is that a 200 million subscriber kind of opportunity there? Or, you know, I'm just curious what your take is on Disney Plus. I don't know if it matters that much, right? I mean, look, Disney's making a ton of money. They're profitable. Netflix is not. Uh, Disney Plus is a nice to have, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's just, it, what it represents is like, Disney's like, you know, we don't, we kind of don't care. Um, we can do that too. It's undifferentiated. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's another channel for us to bring more people into the Disney family. Uh, how so much do you think, yeah. How much do you think um, of a risk COVID is to their theme park business going forward? I mean, is this something that, um, is going to be a significant drag or, or do you think it's just priced in and something that, you know, you can get comfortable with just given where the stock price is? Yeah. I, um, you know, you're asking me about my, I think COVID's going to go away at some point. And I think the theme parks are going to come back. To normal. I think we're going to kind of get to a point where we're going to live with this and we're going to get back to our lives. We're not going to permanently sort of um, be stuck in inside um, and not enjoying life the way we once did. Does the, does the macro environment as it relates to rates um, reinforce your positions here on, on Netflix and Disney or, or, or not? I'm just curious. It what does. It does. I think the rate environment is a big part of the reason why the short side of our portfolio has done so well. I think the reason stocks like Netflix and Tesla, sort of the original meme stocks, as well as meme stocks, the reason they've just been so crazy um, going up is because people have had like a virtually unlimited amount of money to borrow and to trade, you know, whether you're getting a stimulus check, uh, whether you're able to borrow on margin. I mean, it's just kind of, um, you know, these are unprecedented times in terms of the amount of stimulus and interest rates going down. It's just sort of like the, the Fed is, was flooded. Everyone knows it's flooded the economy with tons of stimulus. And, you know, when you got money to burn, you got money to lose. You're just going to gamble, gamble, gamble. Um, and now that that regime has changed, <coughs> and we're now living in a world that's more where, where rates are not going down, and it's not so limitless, you know, what happens? People become more discerning with their money, right? If you don't have money to lose, you're going to be more careful. And part of being more careful means you don't necessarily want to invest in a bunch of very high-priced, profitless businesses, um, I wouldn't anyway. I think that I think most of your rational sort of even average folks, even your crazy speculators start to think, uh, maybe I need to be a little more careful. And all of a sudden, that crazy speculative uh, betting stuff gets shut down real fast. Dave, I think that's really sage advice. Um, well, we're certainly going to be following uh, the Netflix story and, and, and Disney as well. Um, and I think it'd be great to, to at some point do a little uh, look back and, and see kind of what's happened. Um, but, but thanks again for taking the time and, and looking forward to uh, hearing more, um, you know, ideas from you over time. My pleasure. Great to be with you guys. Thanks, David. Thank you. Okay. Awesome.